guys welcome back to my channel if you're new here my name is Miranda I share my nightly devotions with you as well as um, the story I don't know if you can see that you should be able to and I've done two videos on this so far and tonight drum roll please I have a new book that I'll be sharing with you it's called decoding the Antichrist and the end times it's by Mark Blitz my Aunt Lisa actually sent this to me. She lives in Washington, so shout out to you, Aunt Lisa. I know that you watch my nightly devotions and my videos, and thank you for your support. I'm super, super excited to jump into this book. Um, I actually was talking with my oldest niece, Autumn, about it last night, and she's excited for these videos too, so shout out to you, Autumn. I'm excited for you to see these videos. Um, without further ado, I will just jump right into this. I have not read any of this yet, so... When I read through this, you're just going to be getting my raw, uncut thoughts on the book as I go. So <clears throat> I'm going to just start through here. Um, it came with a bunch of cool stuff as well. Um, so we will get straight into it. The first part is called Part 1, Exploring Theories, Myths, and Misconceptions. And the first chapter is called A Historical Perspective. So I will try and take a snapshot of the contents page of this book and put it up on the screen and you guys can look at it. And I'll just put that up now and give you like five seconds to just look at it. Okay. So I'm going to read the introduction to you because um, I think that the introduction will probably be important for this book. So the introduction is titled, Will the Real Antichrist Please Stand Up? I like that play on Eminem right there. Humanity is desperately seeking someone with a strong hand to take the helm and bring about world peace. Some look for a strong leader who has the ability to compromise and appease every faction to stop all the madness. But what character traits are truly needed to navigate the strong currents of public opinion that shape the world we live in? Life and history go through continually repeating cycles just as our seasons do. It's so true that history repeats itself. If you go back and look through time, and I've talked about this with my mom and my Aunt Katie. So Aunt Katie, if you're out there, shout out to you and my mom too, shout out to you. We talk a lot about how evil has a modus operandi, an MO, and it repeats itself because they want the same thing. They want destruction. They want to own the world. They want to win against God. And that's all that the world is about. There is an ever ongoing battle between the demons and Satan and God and his angels. And you know who's caught in the crosshairs and the crossfire? Us. Both ways. So demons are coming at us, trying their best to just let us, let us in, let us in, so that they can wreak havoc in your life. And then the other way, you've got the Holy Spirit speaking to you, let me in, let me guide you, let me protect you. And it's our decision which way you're going to go. And it's such a big picture that it's so hard to wrap your brain around, especially at first. But I've gotten really deep into understanding of what's going on in the, the realm of the unseen, what we can't see. So maybe you'll think I'm a kook, maybe you won't. If that's not your jam, then this probably won't be your jam. Feel free to stick around if you want, though. Um, but yeah, I have a lot of theories and a lot of thought put into this. So I'm going to just continue on. Otherwise, this video is going to be like an hour long. <clears throat> because humanity is basically the same, these cycles repeat themselves with different characters and scenes. We can learn a lot about the end times when we understand these cycles. And that's what we will explore in this book. <laughs> I'm so excited. For the past 2,000 years, people have been anxiously trying to analyze who the Antichrist might be and when he might be revealed. Many people have made preposterous claims about the revelation knowledge they received as to who the Antichrist really is, and of course, they have always been wrong. 
If you're not careful, as you can get caught up in the debate, or worse, you can be deceived. To complicate matters, we now live in the air in an era when, for the first time, we have the possibility of an artificial intelligent antichrist. I don't know if you guys have heard about all the AI stuff going on, especially with um, the alleged AI demon. I haven't looked into it, but my brother has done some looking into it, and I guess it's a real thing. So I also saw a video on it not long ago where the lady that was making the video was talking about a little boy who was talking to an AI robot. And when the little boy asked who it was, they told him, they, the response was that they were a demon. So creepy stuff, not a fan of AI, especially on this whole Snapchat thing with the my AI and you can't get rid of it. I hate that. You can't get rid of it. I've been told that you can only get rid of it if you have Snapchat Premium. Well, pff, I'm not getting Snapchat Premium, and neither is most of the other part of the, you know, everybody else in the population. Nobody wants Snapchat Premium. So you have this weird My AI thing that sits on the top of your Snapchat and never goes away, and I hate it. And I also don't talk to it. I don't do anything with it. It sits there since it showed up like two and a half weeks ago and I do not bother with it because I don't want any part of that. Yuck. So, uh, to finish the sentence, it says, a human computer hybrid that will demand to be worshiped. Have you ever wondered if it's okay to have Alexa, Siri, and other forms of AI in your home? We know that the Bible says great deception is coming. So what is a concerned believer to do? It's critical to understand the modus operandi of the Antichrist so you won't be deceived. And that's why I have researched the topic extensively and written this powerful book to answer questions such as the following. What does the Bible say about the Antichrist, his tactics, and his motivation? Will the Antichrist be Muslim, a Jew, or a Christian, or something else? Will the Antichrist work through modern technology to take over? Does the Bible give us clues about the Antichrist and the end times? I will begin with a historical perspective that answers the questions of how we got to where we are today. The Bible talks about the Antichrist spirit having been in the world for a very long time. It's a spirit of lawlessness. Next, we will explore the end time perspectives of the three different monotheistic faiths, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, of which most believers are unaware. I found the comparisons to be very intriguing, so we will explore an overview of each one. Beginning with the Jewish, Jewish faith, you will discover how they believe there are two messiahs coming, not just one. That's new to me. He didn't lack... Hold on. This was even John the Baptist's concern when he asked to see if Jesus was the Messiah or if there was another one coming. He didn't lack faith, but he was just wondering if there was another one coming as well. Then we look into the Islamic faith. I was surprised to find out they also have a version of an Antichrist and a beast that rises up out of the earth. They even believe two different Jesus figures will arrive, one being the real Jesus and the other a fake Jesus. Then we will touch on the Christian perspective of the end times with a view that focuses on what will happen more than when it will happen. This leads the way to the next chapter where we analyze the concept of replacement theology and its origins in Greek philosophy. Replacement theology actually began more than 100 years ago before the church even existed. Replacement theology and Greek philosophy have affected or skewed our end times view. Interesting. We will also take a short look at other theories about the Antichrist, such as AI technology like Siri, Alexa, and Watson, which are creeping into our lives on a daily basis and changing our perspective of how things could possibly play out, even in the next few years. Following this, we will jump into the scriptures to see how Solomon is not to be our model for the Messiah, but actually the model for the one who appears righteous, but actually leads us away from the Messiah. This may come as a shock, but I will allow the scriptures themselves to tell you the amazing story of Solomon's lawlessness and how he was the number one narcissist of all time. 
Wouldn't you like to have that title? Woofta. He was full of arrogance, thumbed his nose at God, and was totally consumed with himself, as you will see. We will then take a fresh look at Matthew 24 through a Hebraic lens. The Bible tells us there is nothing new under the sun, and that which has happened is that which will happen again. We will find this is totally applicable when it comes to Matthew 24. While it speaks of end time events, we will discover it is actually about many aspects of Hanukkah happening all over again. You will learn not only that Hanukkah is very biblical, having been prophesied to come in the book of Daniel, but also that aspects of Purim, sorry if I butcher that, will be repeated during the end times. I don't know a lot about Hanukkah or really Judaism at all, so you'll probably see that um, ignorance through this book. We are currently reliving some aspects of the times of Purim, which were read about in the book of Esther. Much like today, it was a time of legalized lawlessness. Isn't that the truth? It really does feel like legalized lawlessness out in the world today. It's legal to go steal in California as long as it's under, what, $1,500? I can't remember what the total was, but they will not persecute anybody as long as it's under a certain dollar amount. Are you joking me? And that's just one instance. It was as if the government would just legalize that which was illegal and then everything would be morally okay. If it couldn't legalize it, it would change the definition of illegal to fit the political moral agenda that is desired. Huh, sound familiar? The term legal would no longer hold its own moral weight. Sound familiar? (laughs) I just said that, whoops. In the book of Esther, we find everything was done according to the law. The murder of six million people was legalized by changing the definition of human. It was occurring during the time of Esther, and it has repeated itself in modern history. If that isn't the truth. So, if you change the definition of human to not include a human in the womb, it's then okay to murder babies inside of their mother, aka abortion. How many millions of babies have been aborted? I don't know the statistic on it. My mom would know that. She's more of the statistics than me. But it... It applies. If you change what is a human, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter anymore. It's now legal. And it was legal. So that's crazy. Let's continue. <clears throat> Look at the Holocaust. Delegitimizing and demonizing the Jewish people led to their deaths. I felt it was one of the utmost importance for the times we are living in right now to create a profile and look at the modus operandi of the Antichrist rather than just try to figure out who he might be. I love that it says he in there too because you know that it's not going to be female. Or at least this says it's not going to be female. So then my brain wonders why. And I guess because men are leaders and that's just the way it's always been. I know that there are people out there that believe that women can do everything men do and they can do it just as good if not better and blah, 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 blah. And I'm the first person to agree that women can do a lot of things, but I'm also going to say that there are a lot of things that women just cannot do that we physically are not created to do. You might be able to do it okay, but it, you're never going to outwork a man. At least not if he's, if, he's, if he's a man, I guess. There are some out there that are the opposite way of they want to be a woman. So, of course, you could probably outwork them. But talking in a normal sense here, normal man against normal woman. And again, you'll probably hate on me for that if you're, you know, don't agree with my viewpoints, which is fine. Um... Men are just stronger. They have more endurance. They have more strength. Physically and biologically are made stronger. And men are emotionally tougher than women. And again, yes, men are emotional. And I believe that they should be free to express those emotions. However, the way that their brain works in comparison to the way a woman's brain works, 
men are emotionally and mentally tougher than women. So continuing on here, um, there are no bonus points for being the first one to figure out who he is. Um, of bigger concern is knowing his tactics and his motivation. Will we know when he has left his fingerprints? This is a much better approach so you won't be deceived. We will also be looking for the handprints of the Almighty. The problem was that most Gentiles had no foundation in biblical truth and were totally immersed in the Greek philosophy of their day, following either the Epicurean or the Stoic philosophers, as mentioned by the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. For the Stoics, the big question was, what is the truth? This is the question that Pilate asked. This is still one of the biggest problems existing in the church today. The depth, or sorry, the death grip of the Greek philosopher philosophical mindset that has permeated all of Western civilization and the church for the past 2,000 years. We follow Plato's thinking more than Peter's. Then we will go on adventure in looking at how all the feasts of the Lord were shadows of what was to come when Messiah arrived. The spring feasts were the shadows of Messiah's first coming, and the fall feasts are shadows of his second coming. This is why it is so much more important to know who the Messiah is than to know who the Antichrist will be. It is just like saying the best way to recognize counterfeit money is by handling only real money. God says there is a... a okay, the next part of this says, why this book at this time? God says there is a powerful delusion coming. I'll let you draw your own conclusion on that, and if you believe that that is at all factual about the time that we are in right now. Too often, Christians get caught up in trying to figure out the date of the rapture, who the Antichrist is, and they end up arguing with other Christians over when everything will take place, which doesn't accomplish anything for the kingdom. They think having the right answer is their ticket to heaven. I would rather be ready for Messiah's coming and wrong on the timing than be right on the timing and not prepared. I don't believe the Antichrist will come looking like Satan, but will manifest himself as a messenger of light or a truth bearer. Can there be more than one truth? This sounds familiar, like right from the Garden of Eden. Our enemy loves to take the truth and twist it or pervert it ever so slightly. Again, can you think of anything in the time that we are living right now that the truth has been twisted ever so slightly to where it kind of sounds like the truth, but it really isn't. Because I can think of a ton right off the top of my head. But again, I'm trying to keep this video under an hour. So if you have some conclusions on that, please drop them down below in the comments. I would love to read your hot takes on what I say. So please comment down below if you have any thoughts, ideas, theories, anything. Put it down below in the comment section. I will do my best to read them all and get back to you. This is why the deception will be so strong, because there will be so much truth in it. The devil already has the world deceived, and now he will go after those who believe in the God of Israel by poisoning the truth. If someone offered you a glass of 100% purified water with a teaspoon of arsenic in it, would you drink it? I wouldn't. The problem today is even worse. People are now drinking 100% arsenic with a teaspoon of purified water and calling it good and absolute truth. The Bible warned us of these days when people will call evil good and good evil. We live in a day of total lawlessness and we are uh, barraged by it every single day. Today, society still holds to the idea that everyone can have his or her own truth and there is no universal truth. How often do you hear that? Well, this is my truth. Okay, well, that's not the truth. There is a difference between my truth and the truth, okay? The truth is there are two genders, male and female, with the very, very small percentage, which I think is less than 0.01%, who are true intersex, okay? That is the truth. So when you have people coming out here who are biologically male saying, well, I'm a woman and that's my truth, baloney, that's not true. You are not a woman. I am a woman. 
And I hate the fact that what I am is now being paraded around as a costume. And if that makes you mad, please comment below. And maybe even say something about it in your community, wherever you're at. It's time for us to stand up because this has to end. This whole my truth business is how we have gotten to where we are now. Because so many of us are trying to be accepting and loving because that's what the right thing is, is to accept and love other people. That we have then allowed the truth to be buried. And it's time for us to uh, bring the truth back. <clears throat> Here is an absolute truth for you. The Bible states that God declared the end from the beginning. If you want to know about the end times, you have to start with Genesis. It's all encoded there. So, like I was talking about, I am reading the story. Okay? This book. Man, I can't figure out my camera. Sorry. The story. Holy Toledo. I'll get there. This one. <laughs> Sorry. Um... And we've started in Genesis. So if you want to know about Genesis, I have two videos up on it right now and I'll be continuing to post. I'm actually going to post one after this video. Sure, people have been saying that we have been living in the last days for a long time. And the skeptics always say the dooms doomsayers are p proved wrong. The problem can be in your definition of the last days. The Apostle John in his first epistle categor categorically states that he was living in the last days. If he was living in the last days 2,000 years ago, how much more are we now? We are in the last days of the last days. The Bible states that a day with the Lord is a thousand years. So as far as God is concerned, it has only been two days since Jesus lived. We are at the door of his third day which has great prophetic significance according to the Bible. My mom and I are super into numbers and meaning as far as biblical, and three is a huge one. Um, three trimesters. Um, it, it, I'll talk about it another time, but again, I'm already at 22 minutes, so I can't go into it. But if you want to know more, let me know and I'll do a video on it because numbers is huge. Three is, okay, three is huge. Um... Exodus 19, we find God telling Moses to be ready for the third day, as that is when he will come down in the sight of all the people. In Hosea, at the end of chapter 5, it states that God is going to be like a lion to the nation of Israel, tearing it to pieces, and then he will go away. This is exactly what happened in AD 70, when the temple was destroyed and Israel was scattered among the nations. Then the Lord states, I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their offense and seek my face. Then comes the prophecy in chapter 6 that they repent, and then it declares that after two days he will revive us, which is exactly what happened when Israel came back on the stage of history in 1948. Following that, we find the phrase, in the third day he will rise us up and we shall live in his sight. This speaks of when the resurrection of the dead will take place and the Lord will be king over all the earth for the millennial reign. I believe we are approaching this third day now. Wahoo, it says. The Apostle Peter and his second epistle warned us that our day there would be, that in our day there would be mockers who would say, where is the promise of his coming? In his second epistle, the Apostle John states that even during his time, there were many antichrists. His list of antichrists was made of those who thought that Jesus' physical body wasn't real, but just appeared real. This is why the Apostle John stated in his second epistle, For many deceivers are entered into the world, who confess not that Jesus is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. And that's 2 John 1, 7. Now he was not saying that whoever denies that Jesus literally walked the planet is an antichrist. His comment was directed to the, those people who follow the teaching that Jesus had no real phys physicality when he did walk the planet. These are the ones to whom he is referring. So one thing we know for sure from the reading of the Apostle John is that antichrists come and go over the years. 
I'm sure there have been thousands of Antichrists over the last 2,000 years, and many are probably walking around the earth at the same time today. If you find one, you can add them to the list. The fact that there are many Antichrists tells us of the prime importance in knowing the profile more than knowing the specific individual, so we won't be deceived. So I had a thought just now as I read this. Maybe, maybe the Antichrist is not a one person. And maybe it's a movement of many with the same M.O. I could be totally wrong, though, because I don't know scripture in and out. I don't know um, Revelation well enough to know exactly what it says. Uh, But with that being said, I kind of wonder. So comment down below if you have a thought on that. The purpose of this book is to help you know the big picture of what has happened historically, what is unfolding in front of our eyes at this very moment, and what the future holds concerning both the Messiah and the Antichrist based on the unfolding purposes of God. Isaiah 25 tells us that a time is coming when God will remove the veil from over all nations. In the book of Revelation, God warns the church that is blind... Sorry. In the book of Revelation, God warns the church that is blind... I just said it again. God warns the church that it is blind and it doesn't even realize it. Much like John chapter 9, when Jesus warned the religious leaders of his day that they were blind, yet they were claiming they could see. Now, I don't know if you guys watch Bo Diddle on YouTube. If you have not seen his videos, please go watch them. He has um, a few different channels. He has Bo Diddle, and he also has um, The Trenches with Bo Diddle. On his channel, he goes to some of the woke churches that are LGBTQ churches that fly the pride flag outside. And he respectfully sits through the service, and then afterwards he speaks with the pastor of that church, just asking them questions. Very calmly respectfully asking questions and he has been kicked out of two of them now these people who are supposed to be christians and i'm not here to sit and say that they're not that's not my job however i do believe that their beliefs are not correct they themselves say that they take portions of the bible um and that they don't believe that it's the true word of god um which is mind-blowing to me how could you even say that And that they don't take the Bible as literally as as maybe um, some other parts of it. That some of it's just metaphorical. And when he gives true Bible verses to back up his questions and what he's saying, these people absolutely lose their mind. Okay? Go watch some of these videos. It it's sick. It's absolutely sick. I have a church in my hometown that's also woke, LGBTQ church, and I kind of want to do the same thing respectfully go ask questions because we are supposed to call out false prophets and people who are, I don't remember the the verse, but I think it was an Ephesians verse verse that he said where you're supposed to um, take out the rotten fruit. Anyway, continuing on, let's read here. Um, I gotta find where I was. Okay. The New Testament plainly states that we see through a glass darkly and only know in part. In Romans 11, Paul states that Israel is also blinded in part. This is a play on the text from Genesis 48, 8 through 10, where it says Israel saw his two grandsons in verse 8, and then in verse 10 it says his eyes were dim and he couldn't see. At the time, he was about to bless not only his grandkids from a Gentile mother, grafting them into the olive tree of Israel, but his own children as well. I believe this tells us that both groups, Christians and Jews, still to this day see through a glass darkly and only know in part. The first group to humble itself and look out of both lenses will be able to see the clear picture. I turned my life over to the Lord over 40 years ago, and for the last 25 years I have been peering through both lenses, Jewish and Christian. My heart 
My heartfelt cry is to prepare God's people for what is coming very soon. We need to be rooted and grounded in biblical truth and not caught up in all the madness of our society that is being pushed upon us by the media. Amen. Turn off your TV. Stop listening to the baloney. Get into your word and understand what God is saying to you. Not everything in the media, actually pretty much nothing in the media right now is true. Go listen to Glenn Beck. Go watch Bo Diddle. Go watch Tucker Carlson. He's another great one. Go, there are so many out there that you could go listen to who are are truthful and give it to you in a way, in a truthful way, okay? Sky News Media is another one. I think they're Australian. And it's sad that we have to hear our things happening in America from Australia, Is that nuts or what? Whoever thought we would be in a time where you can't even watch your own news because it's all, it's all propaganda to push the narrative of what they want. And it's insane. So again, my mom watches Sky News Media and I've seen bits and pieces of it. So if I'm wrong on where they're out of, I apologize on that. But I'm pretty sure that Sky News Media is out of Australia. Okay. Um, the other thing that I was, I wanted to say here was my aunt who sent me this book, um, Lisa is Messianic Jew and she sends all kinds of stuff, um, because she is taking a class on how to read Hebrew and she goes to, um, her church out in Washington that is, um, Messianic Jew. And so I get to learn all these things about, uh, how they see things that are, it it helps me see through both lenses is what I'm trying to say. And I'm definitely not going to sit here and tell you that I'm seeing out of both lenses clearly because I'm not. But I thought it was a really cool thing to read because I see it through my Christianity and my aunt's Messianic Jew lenses. So if you're interested in that, try to do some research into Judaism Um, and yeah, it, it will blow your mind. Okay. As I mentioned, we will look into the history of Purim later. We do know though, the famous question that Mordecai asked Esther, who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Wow. My mom's jaw is going to drop too, because that is our verse for such a time as this. We always say that because it's hard in these times to be who we are, to stand proudly in your Christianity, and to come up against the evil that's trying to overtake this world. To say, no, I'm not going to play into your psychosis. No, I will not sit here and say that a man can be a woman and a woman can be a man. No, I will not sit here and say that murdering a baby isn't just that. Murder. I'm not going to sit here and say that it's okay. And a lot of those things are hot button issues that if you come up against, you are automatically a bigot. You're automatically a Christo-fascist. That's another one that they like to use now. So for such a time as this, stand strong and have people around you that are going to help hold you up. When you pause to think about it, you could have lived in any time period of history, but God chose you for such a time as this. Okay? Hear that. God chose you for such a time as this. He chose me, my mom, my sister, my brother, my aunt, everybody in my circle, Jody Ray, my Aunt Connie, or my Grandma Connie, my Grandma Bonnie, all of us, he chose us for such a time as this. Such a time as this. We were meant to be here. The best is always saved for last. You have been chosen to live during the most prophetic times of all history. Let us begin our journey together as we better prepare ourselves for our time. So this video is going to be well over a half hour. So starting in... My next video is going to be part one, okay? Part one is exploring theories, myths, and misconcepts. And I'm so excited about this that I'm literally going to stop this video and start the next one because 
I want to know more and I know that you guys are going to want to know more. So drop a comment down below. I'm really looking forward to seeing your comments. Give this a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to know when these videos are posted. Go check out some of my other content, guys. I'm so excited for you to be here. I'm so excited for this book. Um, there's another book that my uh, niece, Autumn, was talking to me about last night. I was looking for it today. I can't find it. Um, but if I do find it, I'm going to start doing videos on that book as well. So thanks for being here. We'll see you in the next video and God bless. Thank you.